Open it up to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is our verse for the year that we're going to be meditating on, praying through, and talking through as a church. And uh, the title is today is um, Invited and Qualified. Now, all of us is the theme of this uh, entire uh, series that we're going to do because the Lord really spoke to me last, in the last couple months of last year that he wants to take the church, all of us, to a place where we can love and worship him in a deeper way, that we would understand who we are in Christ. And so that's why it's titled All of Us. People are saying, what does it mean, all of us? Is it like we are the world? We're going to feed the children? No, we'll feed the children. But all of us is all of us growing together and doing our part to build the kingdom of God. So I'm going to read it to you, Feast, uh, First Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, listen, this is to you. This is to every believer that says, I know Jesus as my Savior. This verse is to you. So I'm going to read it again. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Today we're going to talk just a little bit about royal priesthood. And I'm going to continue all month, and even on Wednesday nights, we've been, Wednesday night was powerful. By the way, how many of you were part of the 24-hour prayer meeting? Raise your hand. Wasn't that amazing? And um, it actually went 28 hours. It didn't go, because I got here at 6 in the morning, and there was already people here praying. We prayed for our, we prayed for our town. We prayed for our area. We just had an amazing time. So when that comes back around, be sure and sign up again. Royal priesthood is what we're going to hit on today. And I'm not going to go too deep on it because I want you to understand what a priest is and I want you to understand what a priest is not. And we'll go deeper over the next few weeks on the assignment of a priest and what they did so that because it correlates to our walk with God. Go to Exodus 28, verse 1. And uh, we, we, we talk about this a little bit on Wednesday night. Exodus 28 is the two chapters in Exodus 28, 29 that I read that the Lord just really impacted me with. Because how many of you know you go and read through the Bible in a year, right? You do your little program. And a lot of us just, if we've read Exodus a lot, we kind of blow through all the, and you shall have a utensil that's made out of gold. And it shall, you know, and you just kind of mindlessly read it. And I was doing that. I was mindlessly reading. And Exodus 28 came and I got caught by the fact how much God cared about the priests and what their assignment was. I mean, it's two full chapters on, hey, this is what you're about to do. So let's look at this. Exodus 28, verse 1. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. You might want to under, underline that. Minister to me. Aaron and his sons. Verse 2. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Underline for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all the gifted artists, basically, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. Isn't that cool? God fills people with the spirit of wisdom who are artists. He gave people wisdom to build things and to make things. So if you're a builder, you, people that can build, how many of you just get blown away by people that can build stuff? Like artists and make all this. When I draw, it literally looks like the same drawing I did in the third grade. There is no difference in my car and stick people. They, they are just, it, I'm not, I drew something the other day and this lady leaned over and said, are you serious? Are you joking? I said, no, that is me. I'm an artist. She goes, well, you're not filled with the spirit of wisdom. <laughs> that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me. You might want to underline that again as a priest. And, and, and these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash, so that they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that they may minister to me as priests. I went through and underlined how many times it said minister to me. God cares about his people ministering to him. And so if you go back to 1 Peter 2, 9, it says that we are a royal priesthood. If you name the name of Jesus and you are born again and Christ lives in your heart, you are a priest before God. Now in the Old Testament, the only people that could go in before the presence of God was Aaron and his sons. They could go into the Holy of Holies. Others had to stay outside of the presence of God. Because in the Old Testament, if you messed up in the Holy of Holies, you died. In the Holy of Holies, if, if you just went like this, let's say you had your coffee, 
Sunday morning church, and you just came in, hey, what's going on, everybody? Boom. You'd be dead. They would tie a rope around the priest's ankle, and the priest would go in to do their thing, and if they messed up and died, I mean, you don't want that job. They would drag them out by a rope because they couldn't just go walk into the presence of God and, and get him. See, that same God is still that holy. Do you know our God is still that holy and amazing? But he gave his son Jesus, so now watch. We have been clothed so that we have the right and the privilege to come into the presence of God and before the presence of God. Isn't that cool? Now, <laughs> here's the problem. How many of you were here during Christmas and I talked about God is good? How many remember that sermon? God is good, we are not. How many remember that sermon? Wasn't that so encouraging to come to church and hear how bad you are? Like, <laughs> never mind. Isaiah 64, 6. This is what it says about humans. All of us. But we are all like an unclean thing. Oh, amen. And all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. I don't know about you, but it's easy to feel that way all the time. I am just undone, unrighteous. You ever think thoughts or have motives or desires and go, man, I am not a good person. Anybody in here besides me? You go, Lord, man, what is wrong with me? It's this right here. We were born into sin. There's no one righteous. Watch this. Romans 3.10 confirms Isaiah 64. <clears throat> As it is written, there is none righteous. How many are there righteous? No one. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They all together have become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. So the idea that mankind is getting better. I want to talk about that for just a minute. That somehow humans are going to just evolve into this wonderful species that loves everybody, and there's going to be harmony and peace everywhere, and it's going to be like the Coca-Cola commercial, right? <clears throat> Just everybody's happy, and everybody's great. We've evolved from the days of Hitler. We've evolved from all these bad people and all these bad things we read about in history, and I say, no, we haven't. <clears throat> we have not evolved. We're not better and more righteous than 100 years ago, than 2,000 years ago. We're actually the same deprived people without Jesus. We're not better. We're not getting more compassionate. We're not getting more righteous. And I, I'm going to say something that might super offend, okay? I'm just letting you know, I'm warning you up front that this might be an airbag moment, okay? In the, in, in the Old Testament, there were societies that would take their babies and throw them to the God of fire. And how many of you go, that is disgusting? Anybody in here think that's bad? Raise your hand. More hands, please. Thank you. <laughs> See what I mean? We have not evolved. <clears throat> like, I don't know. It's not bad. We do the same thing today. And it's called abortion. But it's just more sophisticated. For the sake of ease and pleasure, we sacrifice our children. And now we can get into the debate, well, is it really a child? Is it do 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 And is it a woman's right? Listen, I don't want to get into all that. I just know this, that we're not better human beings. Because we're, by the hundreds of thousands doing that in our country, that is so great. We have Audis and Toyotas and nice clothes and big houses. And around us is pure, pure offense to the Lord. It's offending him that we would do that. Now, I know we're going to, I'm going to get emails about it. It's okay. I'm going to stand up for what I believe is righteous and true. And by the way, yeah, if you, if, you, <laughs> if you have had an abortion, by the way, it's rampant. It is rampant, the number of, of women that have had abortions. If you've had an abortion, God loves you. He forgives you. He heals you. He welcomes you. You are, you are forgiven. Please hear that, okay? <clears throat> But we're not better. But look at this. Here's the good news. Isaiah 61, verse 10. This is a picture of what Jesus would do. A prophetic picture of Jesus coming. <clears throat> I will greatly <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. 
For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. What has he done? Clothed me with garments of salvation. Thank you. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. By the way, there's something about that in the New Testament that Jesus puts on the what? We have the breastplate of righteousness. He is our covering. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. That's the work of God. God came to a broken, messed up planet and said, I'm going to cover you. Why? Because I want relationship with you. I'm coming to you not to condemn you, not to destroy you, not to beat you up, but I came to give Jesus so that you can be covered so that you can have access to the Father and that so you can watch. This, this is where we're going we're gonna to go, go nuts in just a minute. Matt, Matt, I'm getting ahead of myself. Galatians 3.26 you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. How are you a son of God? Through faith in Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. He is my covering. If you look at the armor of God in Scripture, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, you know, he's talking about the armor of God, putting it on every day. Watch, the helmet of salvation. Jesus is my salvation. The, the, the breastplate of righteousness, Jesus gives me righteousness. He's my righteousness. The belt of truth, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The shoes of the gospel of peace, Jesus is the prince of peace. Watch this. The shield of faith, God is the author and finisher of my faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of my faith. The sword of the spirit, John 1, he is the word of God. So we are clothed in Christ. When we would live in Christ, that's when we're complete, when we try to live outside of Christ, we are not complete. And so now we have the ability to come in before the presence of God, just like Aaron, you have been clothed with beauty and glory, and his name is Jesus. Isn't that cool? So when you pray and you come in here and worship and you sing songs, I believe in you, God's going, yeah. He's not going, oh, I saw what you did yesterday. Now, we do need to repent and confess our sins. I'm not saying we don't. But he has clothed you. He made you. You have been built. Please hear this. You have been built for glory. God made human beings to have fellowship with him, Adam and Eve, to have fellowship with him. We were made to live in the glory and the presence of God. He built your spirit to be full of his glory. And when you don't know Christ and you go outside of God to find life, and you get into stuff that's not of God, you get into weird religions and all kinds of stuff, you weren't built to communicate with demons. You weren't built to have that in your life. You were built for beauty and for glory. So when you pray, when the church prays, we are literally clothed with Christ, and we get to have full access into the presence of God. Now, when we were having our 24-hour prayer time in here, it was cool. I mean, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't here for 24 hours. I just want you to know that right now. Now, there were some people here that I saw that were here for like seven hours. There were youth and young adults here at two in the morning, and they stayed till like five or six in the morning praying. They weren't playing laser tag. They were praying. And I walked in here. I was here three or four hours during the day, and then seven to nine, we had worship in here, and a bunch of you came to that, and it was wild. And then, and then I came in about uh, eight in the morning, an hour before it was going to close. And I walked into the sanctuary, and I was like, whoa. Like, I just, I felt the presence of God, like, whoa. And this person comes up, and they're like, man, it's awesome in here. And I was like, well, that's not how they sounded, but. <laughs> we were built for that. That's why when people find Jesus for the first time and they pray and they read their Bibles and they worship God, they come up to me all the time and go, I don't know what it is, but every time I come in here and pray and read my Bible, I just feel good. My, my life changed. I go, yeah, because you were built to walk with God. You were built to be a priest to him. God made every human being to have glory and beauty in their life. Isn't that sick? Now that should make you, you're not smiling enough. You were made for glory. You were not made for pride. Pride kills you. Just ask the devil. The devil was destroyed by pride, by wanting to be more than what God made him to be. 
And he, he, he literally destroyed his life. When we walk with God and we say yes to Jesus and we live in the presence of God, his glory heals us. It doesn't kill us. His presence is what he wants in our lives. I'm going to prove it to you. John 17, verse 22. Look at this verse. Now Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. This is, this is right before he's going to be crucified. And he's praying for the disciples, the first seven or eight, 10, 12 verses. He's praying for his 12 disciples. And then he shifts and he prays for all who will believe, which is me and you. And watch what he prays. We bump over this all the time. John 17, 22. And the glory, he's praying to his Father, and the glory w which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Look what Jesus said. The glory that you have given me, I have given them. And what is the glory of God? We've talked about this before. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And what did God do? He said, you, you, you can't see it full on or you'll die. That's how amazing it is. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of this rock. And I'm going to pass by you. And when I pass by you, you're going to see basically me walking away from you. And you're going to see all of my goodness. That's what it says. The glory of God is the goodness of God. It's who he is. It's his character. And so God has intended for every human being to share in the glory of God. That's why Moses, when he would go up on the mountain with God and pray, and he would come down, and people would say, whoa, hey, go away, stop looking at us, you're shining with the glory of God. Remember that? Right? And they made him put a sack over his head. Why? Because he had been in the presence of God, he had been in the glory of God. See, what happens to believers is when we walk with Jesus and we really set out to pursue him and love him, his glory is infectious. I spend time with him. And now when I go out and about in the world, people go, I don't know, there's just something different about that guy. There's just something different about you. You're different. What is it? Well, it's, well, you know, I, I know Jesus. And they're like, no, it can't be that. You take vitamins? I do take vitamins, matter of fact. But it's the glory of God. It's the glory of God on our lives. So God has qualified us to do this. He's invited us. Jesus said, come, all you who are, who are weary and heavy burden, I'll give you rest, and he's qualified. Look at Colossians 1.12. This is talking about you and me. <clears throat> Colossians 1.12 says this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. By the way, just a little, just, just a little side note. In your prayer time, take that verse. Take those two verses, three verses, and pray about them. God, thank you today. I'm going to show you how I do this. Father, thank you that I have been qualified by you to walk with you, to be a partaker of your kingdom. Thank you that you've delivered me out of, uh, of darkness and you've brought me into the kingdom of your son. Thank you that I've been redeemed by your blood and I have forgiveness of sins. Man, it'll change the chemistry of your life when you start to pray like that. But look at this. He has qualified us. How many of you in your job have to qualify sometimes for things? Anybody? Yeah? I hated qualifying for stuff that I wasn't gifted at. Amen? When I played basketball, now I was a good little basketball player in high school, junior high, I never worried about not, not being able to make the team. I never, ever once said, I'm not making the team. I never had that thought, ever. I just went out for basketball. I didn't play my eighth grade year, and... The coach came to my house and said, why aren't you playing basketball this year? And I was like, I don't want to. And he was like, well, you're dumb. And I was like, whatever. But there was a confidence. Watch. There was a confidence in me because I came from a basketball family that I was going to make the team every time. Never worried about it. Now making the math team? <laughs> How many of you know I'm sweating bullets? Rick, why don't you come out for the math team? Well, let's see. Let me do some math for you right now. <laughs> my grade point average, my eighth grade year, was 0 0.89. What was your grade point average? 3.89? Yeah. I'm the last two numbers of your whole entire number. <laughs> That's the math. You see, it's fun to qualify and feel good about something you're good at and know that you're shaped to do. 
But it's a whole other deal when, you at, when you're asked to be qualified to do something, like typing. I don't type. I type. <laughs> this is how I type. And I bet you there's a lot of guys in here that type this way, huh? I'm not the only one. We were sitting in our senior leader team meeting several, several weeks ago, Noah and Billy and Jen, and we were meeting, and I was, had my laptop, and I was writing something down, and, and Jen was sitting over here, and she, I noticed that she was looking at me, and I just looked over at her, and she goes, what are you doing? Are you using your thumbs and your two index fingers? And I said, yes. And she went, oh. And then she started typing, you know, those arrogant typers? They're not even looking down, right? They're just talking to you and typing at the same time. I'm like, this, you're lying. And you go over, oh, yeah, I guess it's pretty good. Right? It's pretty good. Listen, thank God the Father through Jesus Christ has qualified us. It's just a matter of receiving the qualification that he's given us. Well, how do you do that? You say, I need Jesus. And he goes, qualified. Qualified to pray, qualified to worship, qualified to seek me, qualified to know me. That should make your heart sore. Here's what the, here's what the New Testament says all the time. Whoever, if anyone. Isn't that cool how it's so broad and open? Whoever will come after me. If anyone hungers and thirsts. You see, it's open. Why is it so open? Why, why is the border of heaven... Oh, this is bad because we're in a border war right now. I'm not going to go down this road. <laughs> heaven is open, man, to anyone who will come and receive Christ because he's qualified us. That's why it's awesome when you stand in here and pray and you worship because it's acceptable to God. And I'm going to show you that in, in just a minute. I remember when I first got saved, I'd probably been saved just a few weeks because I got saved August 7th, 1983. I mean, really met the Lord like in a big way. And I remember this. I, I've told you this story several years ago, but I, I, three weeks before school started, me and my, I lead my best friend to Christ. We're praying, you know, throughout that last few weeks of summer. And we show up at school and we're there about a week or two and our, the guitar player from the band that I used to play in, who was not a believer, was really, really sick. And so we heard about it at school, and he lived a block from the school. And so me and my long-haired hippie buddy, we go, I go, come on, dude, let's go. We're going to go pray for Tom. And he's like, really? I go, yeah, the Bible says. I just, I just read it and go do it. See, the problem is now we want to study it. So all we want to do is study and I believe in Bible studies. I believe in the Bible says study to show yourself approved. I believe in Bible studies. The problem is, is we think that collecting truth is actually doing truth. So I've studied it. I've looked at it from every angle. I've memorized everything in Greek and Hebrew. Right? You've heard the old thing where the guy says to go tell his, his daughter, go clean your room. And an hour later, he comes back and the room isn't clean. What are you doing? Well, Dad, I memorized what you told me to do. Four hours later, it's not done. She's sitting in a room with her friends. What are you doing? We're studying it in Greek, what you told me to do. <laughs> but you never do it. So I get my buddy, and we, we go, I go, dude, I read in the Bible where it says that if we believe in Jesus, we'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. So we walked off campus. The principal tried to stop us. He said, where are you guys going? He said, we're, we're going to pray for a friend. He was like, okay, go ahead. He, was, he didn't want to even talk to us. <laughs> So we walk over to his house, and we knock on the door. Tom's mom answers the door, and we go, hey. You know, she knew us from the party days, and we're here to pray for Tom. She was like, really? Yes. Is, he's, well, he's very sick. He's in bed. He's, I don't even think he, he'll know you're there, but go ahead. Oh, all right. So we go in and shut the door behind us. Tom is four foot ten. His hair was like five foot two. Just laying in his bed with his hair. And I got down by his feet and my I go, you get up by his chest. And one, two, three. You go for the chest, I'll go for the feet. Isn't that weird? We're so immature. 
So I grab onto his feet. And all I said was, Father, thank you for the word that says we'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. In the name of Jesus, I said, be healed. He wakes up, jolts up, and says, what was that? And I go, dude, it's Jesus. And he goes, where is he? I said, he's in here. And, and obviously he received the Lord. How many of you know you received the Lord when a miracle, his mom was blown away. I mean, just recovered in an instant. Why? Because I'm qualified. Even at two weeks in the Lord, three weeks in the Lord. You are qualified to go pray, to go. So many people call me all the time, Pastor, can you come over here? My friend's really struggling and pray for him. No. You pray. Well, I don't know how to pray. Well, figure it out. Go get in the Bible and figure it out. Just go try it. Just go lay hands on them and pray. Instead of thinking that I'm the only guy that can do it. Now, I'm not saying I would never come and pray for somebody who's sick, but you know what I'm saying. I want you to feel qualified and you to do it because God has qualified you to do it. I'm gonna, 1 Peter 2.4 says this. This is what the scripture says. It says, coming to him as to a living stone, that's talking about Jesus, rejected indeed by men, talking about Jesus, but chosen by God and precious, that's talking about Jesus. Then it switches. You also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Watch what you are. You are we are a spiritual house, we are a holy priesthood. We offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. When you pray and worship, when you pray and worship, I'm say it one more time. When you pray and worship, it is acceptable to God because Jesus came and covered you. And it's through Jesus that we go to the Father. So therefore, you are a spiritual giant in the kingdom. When you pray and worship, God hears you. Amen? Now... How many of you, the word royal priesthood kind of makes you go, huh? Royal priesthood. Well, I've been studying royal priesthood. Now, please don't hear me. I'm not going to bash the Catholics. How many of you were raised Catholic? A lot of you. <laughs> My mom was raised Catholic. And, and uh, I remember when she got saved, I was three years old. Um, I was, we were living in Cottonwood, California. We moved from L.A. to Cottonwood, which is this little cowboy town. And across the street, right across from our, our house was a fire station. And one morning at three, I got up. And now, when, we, when I was little, they would just put you outside when the sun came up and then bring you back in when the sun went down, right? <laughs> Remember those days? Like, no, you go outside and play. Here's a, here's a peach. Go outside, you know, for the rest of the day. Oh. We're worried about being kidnapped or killed or nothing. You know what I'm saying? We were just, do whatever you want. Go. Play with in the street if you want. It doesn't matter. I heard music coming from the fire station. And I was like, huh, three years old. I'm going to go see what's over there. I remember walking over there just, huh, open the door. The sweet old lady standing there. They were planting a church. They were using the fire station. And the sweet little old lady was like, hello to me. Not where are your parents? Nothing. <laughs> right? Nowadays, they'd be like, call the cops. And, you know, the cops would be there. Child abuse, the whole thing. And here comes, here comes this little old lady with a candy bar. You can convert me with a candy bar. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> At three years old. She gives me a candy bar. I sit down, eat in the candy bar. I go to Sunday school. I hear about Jesus. I'm like, sweet. My mom and dad come to try to find me. They find the music hall. They're in the church. They were in that church for 47 years. They built the new campus and everything. It was amazing. She got saved, and she says, you know what bothers me the most? What made me so mad is that no Catholic priest ever told me that I could have a personal relationship with Jesus. No Catholic priest ever told me that I could pray, that I could read my Bible. They were the ones that were going to tell us what it was all about, and they were the ones that went to God for us, and she started reading the Bible, and she never found proof of that in Scripture because you are a royal priesthood, not just they. And so when I say to you royal priesthood, you're thinking about the robe. No. There is not a man. I'm, I'm going to say this really, really radical. You have as much access to God 
through prayer, through Jesus Christ, through the Word of God, than the Pope. You do. Look right here. He is not any more holy than you are. He's not. There's nowhere in the Bible that teaches, well, that guy's super holy and you're mini holy. It's hard for some of you to hear because your Catholic brain goes right into guilt right now. Like, is he going to be struck dead on the stage? Right? My mom dealt with all that stuff, that Catholic guilt. Man, that's what I call it. Now, I'm not bashing the Catholic Church. I think they do some great things. A lot of people, my, my uncle was a charismatic Catholic missionary. I'm not, I'm not bashing. I'm just saying that we've been taught wrong. And then we carry that teaching into our life. You are a royal priesthood. What does it mean? Here's what it means. This is so good. You're about to get just jacked up right now. <laughs> royal means this, kingly. Why are you a kingly priesthood? Why are you a, a, called in the book of Revelation, we have been made kings and priests to our God. Why? Because we are royalty. And we don't understand royalty because we don't have kings and queens in America. But boy, they do over across the pond. And remember when that girl got married? <laughs> remember that? Every time I turned the TV on for 10 days beforehand, it was like, she's getting married. And I was like, who cares? <laughs> who is she? I don't care. She's not American. You know, I played that whole thing. <laughs> and everyone's watching it. Oh, look at the chariot. She's... Horses are pulling, oh my gosh, it's a glass dome. Look at the dress. And I'm going, could we put Die Hard on, please? You know? <laughs> starting to tear up here. <laughs> Royalty. Do you think the kids that are born into that family, do you think they have access to go places in the palace that you and I could never go to? Yeah. I walk up, you walk up to the gate of the, whatever they call it, parliament, whatever their weird names are over there. Ours is the White House. I mean, come on. Simple. Watch. There's a guy with a big furry hat on. You know those things? You, you know those big hats? I don't understand that. I would not be in that army. I'd be like, no, I'm not wearing the hat, man. You lost me. Big old giant, I don't understand what's under there. I don't know if there's a weapon under there. They take it off. and it, I, It's huge. How do they chase somebody with that hat on? They're just uh, top heavy. They're, what they, they go under doors. They can't make it under door frames, right? They're just boom. They're, they're, they got to go low, and the guy's like, lower, man. They're playing that game where you go under the, right? It's crazy. Anyways, I'm over that. Uh, anywho. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, royalty goes, I can go there. The little kids walk up to the gate. The guy with the furry hat goes, opens the gate, shuts the gate, lets him in. You and I go up to the gate. They ain't letting you in the gate. How I many you know it's true? One of the greatest pictures that I, I think is so cool of a picture of being invited into royalty is the old picture of JFK when he's sitting at his desk in the White House. And John Jr. is under the desk with the little door open, playing. How many of you have seen that picture? It's such a great picture. Did you know that you couldn't do that? If you went to the White House today to meet the president, and you said, hey, can I, uh... <laughs> you think I could go just play with little cars while you're working? How many know you get kicked out of the White House? But when you're royalty, you have access and favor into places that other people don't. You are a royal priesthood. You have access to your father. You are kingly in the kingdom. You, when you start praying, he goes, there's my son. There's my daughter. What do you need? But see, some of us came from environments where guilt and shame was used in our lives. So the idea of coming before a, a father and asking him for anything is tough because when you went to your father and asked him, you might have got the backhand. You might have got the harsh words. Well, God doesn't do that. He's qualified you to be a partaker in the kingdom. I'll close with a verse. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, his name is Jesus, who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. In other words, don't lose confidence. 
Be confident because God has, through his son Jesus, given you access. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Watch this. Here's the verse. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. What is it that we're finding? Grace in time of need. How do we come? Boldly. I don't walk into this place to pray and worship and I'm like, oh, if you would just, do you think you could like me? I feel so undone and so bad about myself. And he goes, well, stop it. It's good to know you're undone, but at some point you're going to have to receive who you are in Christ instead of wallowing in guilt and shame. And you stand tall and you lift your hands during worship. Why does the Bible say to lift holy hands to the Lord? I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Timothy, lift holy hands to the Lord. Why? Because it's a reminder to me that I'm holy in Christ Jesus, that I'm forgiven. This is what the Bible says to do. Lift holy hands to the Lord. I don't feel very holy. Well, you are. Now take your rightful position and worship because you are holy because of the blood of Christ. And when you start knowing that you're cho chosen, royal, forgiven, you'll start living like you're chosen, royal, and forgiven. Amen?